Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to this uh, visit to the Green Village of uh, Workplace Pride, a uh, combined event of Workplace Pride Tech and Workplace Pride Academia. Um, welcome also to the people uh, watching at home and those in the room. I hear a slight echo, but I see that the technicians are working. Also. In the meantime, um, I'm doing a brief introduction. My name is Julia van Kampa. I'm the chair of TrueU, which is the LGBTIQ plus uh, employee resource group of the TU Delft. And together with um, uh, Christina Holtkamp and with uh, Martijn van den Tillaert, I had the pleasure, uh, where are you Martijn, there, to organize uh, this event. Uh, the theme of today's event will be uh, diversity and inclusion in uh, the built environment. Uh, so uh, we have a very nice program uh, that we have uh, set up. I think for the other microphones it will be better. Just keep talking uh, through the act. I apologize for uh, the inconvenience. Um, and what uh, I would like to discuss quickly before I give the floor to our speakers uh, are some household um, announcements. First of all, should you have a question, uh, and the speakers will indicate when they would like questions for, for their, their presentation, but if you have a question, raise your hand and I will come uh, to you with the microphone. Uh, this way it's also captured for the people at home. Um, the people at home, you can ask questions uh, using uh, the Q&A function in uh, Microsoft Teams. Please be aware that there's a two-minute delay between uh, the event happening here and the live stream that you're seeing at home. So have a little bit of patience. Uh, we have somebody monitoring uh, the Q&A all the time. And after that, uh, we will just uh, read out loud your question and it will be answered too. Uh, so, uh, before I begin, one uh, other question. Uh, those of you uh, who would not like to be photographed, because we have a photographer in the room, can you please raise your hand, just to be sure? Okay, you do not want to be photographed. Uh, oh, you do. But is there anyone who objects to being photographed? Yeah, okay. Eric, did you... Uh, that there's one, the gentleman uh, in the back does not want to be uh, on the pictures. Um, other than that, I would like to make a quick round in the room to see which uh, organizations are present, and then I give the floor to David. So, can you state from which organization you are? I'm uh, Gretchen van Veen. I work for uh, ASML, uh, right uh, close by. As it happens. Thanks. I will do this very quickly, just just to uh, speed things up. ASML as well. Also ASML. Great. Moving on to the next table. Um, Arcadis. TU Delft. Faculty of Architecture, TU Delft. Thank you. Aliander, great company. Aliander. Aliander. Great. Rijkswaterstaat. The Ministry of the Interior and Kingdom Relations. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want? Yeah, Workplace Pride. <laughs> Um, and let's continue here. Um, CWI. NWO. Elsevier. Elsevier. <laughs> <laughs> TU Delft. Tata Steel. Kinderul. Saxion. The Police Academy. Uh, Saxion. ASML. Great, thank you very much. Well, so you can see that it's a very diverse group that we have present here uh, today. And, um, well, I think I took long enough for this introduction. So, once again, welcome to this event. And I would like to invite the first speaker, the Diversity and Inclusion Officer of the TU Delft, David Kiesen. Please give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, it's an honor to be here today. And uh, thanks to Juliana for the, for the invitation to speak. I was told last minute it would be in English, but I could manage that, I think, so no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're quite a new, a relatively new group. I should probably say that uh, I've been about two years in my function, and this is the f we've only had the office about one and a half years. So what I show you today, keep that into account. So we are making inroads. Uh, we have a ways to go, but uh, we're quite young. So um, one of our speakers uh, last year, in our last DNI week, was uh, Esther um, uh, Molema. And um, I think she had a nice saying. She said, if you're not explicitly working on diversity, 
you are being exclusive. So it's something that we really have to be conscious and aware about. And um, I see many examples in my everyday work of people who just aren't really trained in DNI. They're sometimes in uh, staff or leadership positions, different positions, and they're just not really don't have the skill set to even um, take on diversity. So we have a, a long ways to go as an as a academic community and, and to learn from each other in general. I think that was a good uh, saying. Um, yeah, and I think also um, if, we, if we aren't inter intersectional, some of us, the most vulnerable, are going to fall through the cracks. So I think also we tend to be kind of black and white. We have women or men, and, but that's, you know, <laughs> that's a very simple way of looking at the world. So it's also uh, not only thinking about we're very much um, working hard in the TU Delft to also uh, see that women can progress also in academia here. We have in some of the faculties relatively low percentages, also students. But then again, as people often think, oh, the female, that's a stereotype white female Western person. And that's obviously not the case. So it's also thinking about uh, diversity uh, throughout and intersectionality. Um, we have some um, yeah, core uh, missions from the TU Delft. Um, we have a thing that's called direct, and so we do have things like respect and diversity. Um, we are missing some understandings like belongingness uh, and inclusion, but you can kind of bring them into the in, as part of the mission. Um, we've worked to... Um, oh yes, it seems to uh, died. It's like the remote battery died. Oh, but um, I'm going to skip a slide now. Oh yeah, so yeah, skip a slide. So um, we we talk about EDI, so it's equity, diversity, and inclusion, and equity is more about providing um, equal chances. So equality is more about the percentages, and equity is about providing equal uh, opportunities. So uh, we, we call it the DNI office, but it's really also about creating equity in the system. Uh, it's really about um, respecting individual differences, um, people have to feel at home, feel safe, and reach their full potential and really kind of flourish in the organization. So that's what we're all about, realizing that. Um, I think there's three important components. I won't read all this text. You can find this uh, shortly on our website. We'll be updating it with this new uh, narrative as well. But I think it's a moral duty to, uh, to work on uh, DNI, and it, it, that's also in terms of our, if we look at society, we should reflect the society, the diversity in the society here at the university on our campus. Um, but even more so, it really enriches innovation. There's a lot of research uh, also on diversity. There's a famous study in, in the journal Nature where they've looked at millions of <laughs> publications, and uh, they saw authorships with different diverse people with different backgrounds they just based it on their names but they had much a higher actually citation rate but we also know that diversity also in teams brings in new perspectives innovation so it's really important to bring people together and if we're talking about the built environment and what's really about also enriching the built environment so that it serves different kinds of needs um, and we're really not only educating um, engineers and designers here on campus and scientists but we're also we're also educating people and we were trying to uh, equip our students with the tools to come out, go out in the real world and, and integrate in society and deal with diversity in society. So it's also important for our uh, future educational goals. Um, now, one of, I think one of the interesting notions is we talk about uh, inclusion, but we could also talk about expansion. And this is just a little kind of cartoon. So you see equity here. Um, in, in, everybody has an equal ladder. They can all stand and look at the field. Um, um, uh, that's equality, right? They all have the same ladder. And so they're all, they all got into the playground and they're on the same ladder to watch the baseball game, I guess it is. Um, equity, now they can all see it, so they are equal in terms of their opportunity. But then we can talk, let's say, more about uh, expansion or and it's liberation, so why not just take away the barriers altogether? And so um, I think that I actually like the word expansion more than the word inclusion because we're trying to expand our system in order to make it more um, embracing. And it's not that people should have to um, uh, adapt, but the system should adapt to the people. Uh, and then also, of course, the people in the system have to <laughs> get along and adapt with each other, of course. But the system itself has to expand. Um, so that's an important point. So we have our, our team. Uh, these are some of the people in our, in our team. 
We also have um, so different roles, different uh, uh, policy makers. Uh, we have students in the group as well. And we also have a, a governance model in our DNI office. So we have in each of the faculties uh, and, and um, organizations like TrueU and uh, Adult Women in Science, uh, also in several of the um, business units, they call them Dienst in Dutch, uh, service units, uh, corporate offices. Uh, so all the faculties also have diversity officers as well, and they're in, the, in this board. So we have a, a big network, um, and we meet about once every two months, and we also engage a lot in training. So we're also working now on an upcoming training will be on open communication, how do you create a safe dialogue, because it's one of the big challenges at this university is also how do you get through some of the kind of hierarchical natural barriers that you find in an academic world that you are feel you can say, express yourself without shame and blaming. Um, so uh, we also have, uh, for example, training coming up on neurodiversity, because we, you know, how do you communicate and deal, uh, yeah, and to interact with people with neurodiversity that you can understand each other uh, and, and build a bridge. So that's, uh, this, we are working on those kinds of uh, trainings as well. Uh, we have a, a kind of a, let's say, a landscape model. And so you can see the different pathways that we have to uh, influence DNI. I hope you can, it's, the letters are big enough on the screen. Yeah, you can see it. Okay. Uh, we have one blank pathway, so we could still fill it in. We don't suggest we have all the pathways. Um, so these are all mechanisms which we can use to influence um, DNI um, culture and, and policy. Um, and we, we recognize four target areas. So we have the students, we have the staff, education, and our research and valorization work as well. In fact, one of the new programs we're starting now with NVO funding uh, is on uh, inclusive innovation and research. So how do you, in fact, create inclusive design teams, people with different backgrounds, how do you manage those differences? Also working on a result which can also maybe serve a, a, a less common, let's say, not a mainstream population, but also uh, different other uh, different kinds of groups, diverse groups. Um, so really thinking about how do you manage diversity in teams with people, people with different backgrounds, different perspectives, and from a methodological viewpoint, developing those methodologies. Um, okay, so these are some of the key uh, topics that were I mentioned. Maybe some of them were the academic staff. We're working very hard to increase our student population in diversity. Our average student tends to be a white male. Uh, on campus here, so we want to have more diversity also in terms of background. One of the biggest challenges here is um, we know that only about 2% uh, of students, let's say with a migrant background, uh, follow an NT profile uh, at high school. So the problem is goes back to the elementary school, so we're now starting a program to reach out to elementary schools to change the whole system because often students in elementary school don't have uh, exposure and opportunity to even get engaged in the sciences. And sometimes also the families, the parents could say, well, you're a great student, go study medicine or law. And well, engineering is, now nah, you get your hands kind of dirty and oil and I'll stay away from that. <laughs> so that's also what we're, we're doing with some of the cultural uh, values as well. So that's our, our to change our, mic our student population, we have to go way back in the pipeline. Uh, we also have our uh, science centers also has open uh, curriculum, open education now, so some of the teachers also in the schools can follow lessons and get more involved and, and supplement, uh, we can supplement some of the educational material as well, because there's also a problem in, in the schools as well. So we have also, um, yeah, we're working on, um, uh, we have a, a big challenge ahead is also on um, uh, gender registration right now, uh, as you probably know, if you get registered in the Dutch system, um, BKR registration, you're, um, yeah, you're either male or fe female, uh, nothing else. And, um, and also, if you're, for students, it's sometimes very difficult because they might go through a gender change during their studies and then the diploma doesn't match their name anymore. So we're also trying to create a, a system as a universe, a, 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 uh, let's say a, a national challenge. We're working together in the Londo, that's a network of uh, diverse officers in Holland to see if we can create registration systems that we can actually change the name of the student uh, in the TU Delft so that it comes out correct uh, on their, uh, at least on their, on their records and their diplomas, even though it's not uh, with the BKR the same. So we're trying to f find their uh, solutions. Um, yeah, we have a lot of uh, different kinds of opportunities. We have also a diversity grant so we can uh, provide students and also in the coming year also staff with different uh, opportunities so we can, um, for example, one of the projects we have is at the Faculty of Architecture, where Julian comes from. So it's a pop-up contemplation center because we are building five on campus, but this is like a fast 
blow up contemplations room for uh, that can serve both students who are in need of a quiet space, but also um, other students like Muslim students who might need a, a prayer space. So uh, we are working on those kinds of facilities. We also have uh, now a plan for all buildings. We'll have a, a gender neutral toilet. So we have a, a master plan. Um, the library is the first that already has that service, but we're working on it. all the buildings will be adapted. So we're also working on facility uh, things. Uh, training is a big part. I mentioned that already, but we're also reaching out more with HR, developing programs with different faculties, um, and also monitoring. We do a lot of surveys, uh, staff surveys. We have now a student survey running, so we're also trying to see where different challenges exist in terms of diversity and inclusion on campus. Um, we do have now, I'm happy to say, the progressive, uh, pro the progress flag um, now hanging at the aula. <laughs> So uh, we, we updated uh, the rainbow flag with the uh, progress flag. And we, um, yeah, we celebrate Purple uh, Friday here. Uh, um, yeah, different events, uh, coming out day, et cetera. So we have, uh, we have now also an inclusion calendar that's on our DNI website. So you can see all the different, uh, also holidays, uh, festivities and things. Um, um, so that's also part of creating more inclusive, uh, let's say campus. Um, and yeah, but we're, um, so I mentioned already the working on um, the name registration, but also also teaching people about pronouns, um, registration, um, creating more discourse, uh, creating uh, allyships, um, and yeah, continually monitoring the needs uh, of the uh, LGBT community on campus, which we're very proud of. So that uh, concludes my talk. Uh, I don't know if there's time for questions, but uh, you're welcome to ask questions as well. Thank you. I think there is some time for questions. So um, are there any questions in the room? Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, one question. So you obviously have quite a track record, I would say, of what you're currently doing. But could you advise to maybe to some of the um, contacts here who are just starting this journey on, on how you started this all up? So what, what were your first priority items and what were, which were the, the things you only developed in a later stage? Yeah, I think, I, think, um, I think the most important thing is to have discussions and talk with people. Uh, to build a network organization, so try to create people in different, um, because things like survey and data analysis takes time, and that if you want to get a jump start, so the best way is to, I would say, to, to not to try to do it on your own, because it's too much, <laughs> you'll, you'll never manage, but to create a network around you uh, and, and build up a, a, a model uh, that, of people who can really bring the insights, and then create as much as you can uh, local, communities and, and uh, foster those communities, also to create maybe also some uh, financial, if you can, if you can pull funding together to pr pr create some funding so you can create some grassroots actions. And then slowly you'll develop the policies and formal governance models, but you can start kind of bottom up that way. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if the trainings that you are offering, if you will make them compulsory for people in certain positions, because uh, it's quite a hierarch uh, hierarchy, hierarchy. Yeah, hierarchical. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, system, of course, and I know of quite a lot. Uh, yeah, uh, for me, then women, women friends that are mm -hmm. doing their PhDs who are struggling with a cis hetero white man professor in this regard, and mm -hmm. I think it would help if they would being forced to take a training rather than that their uh, female PhD students has to suggest it. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> the, we, see, we see faculties like TBM, for example, now. They are doing um, required training for all people in leadership functions. So they're doing unconscious bias training, observer training. So there we see uh, the dean being really very proactive. And I think uh, I've had now discussions with all the deans and they're very supportive and really want to introduce and bring in training. Um, and I think an important point is not only training the, the leadership and the management, but also training the people uh, on the, the floor because it's a two-way communication. And you, it's easy to point the finger at and say, oh, management is the leadership, but it's also the people. And also um, what I said about creating a safe space where you can speak out, because I, I, I was telling Julian, I was a bit late here today because I had one of a colleague in tears coming to me. Um, and it's, 
it's so important that people dare to speak up and say, speak out. And actually, people are, that's one of the biggest obstacles. And, just, and then if you don't, if you're not satisfied with what you hear, then you go up to the next level and you go up to the next level. And I can assure you that, that the, the problem isn't, is it the, it's in, isn't in at the higher level. It's often at the middle somewhere in the sandwich. Yeah? There's problems. And then, but once you get out of that level, <laughs> so you have to also kind of understand the, how the system works in a way. And, and, but yeah, we are in need of, of, um, of communication skills. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very much lacking. Yeah. Okay, based on, you have a question, Christine? No. Yeah. Last question, because uh, of time we need to move on. Uh, I'm I'm curious to know uh, how did you become so involved in this subject? Ah. because that's as yeah. a role model. In, uh, yeah, yeah. I look like a white male, but I'm I myself am Jewish, so I'm probably one of the more persecuted people on this planet. If you look at our history, um, so I've been a, I am a minority, although I don't look like one. Maybe I have darker hair, but uh, but I I do inside feel like one. Um, and I've lived in four different countries and different cultures. Um, so I, I, I started off also doing social science before I went more into uh, human factors engineering. So I have a background back then. And honestly, I've reached a point in my career. I'm, a, you know, I'm a, let's say I'm a senior professor or whatever. Right? I never, I don't even use my title anymore, but I am. Um, and so I don't need to make career anymore. You know, I've done that already. <laughs> and now I think I'm at a point where I want to give something back also to the community. So I don't have, it's all in my heart. There's no extra gain for me or, uh, let's say, compensation or anything. I just do this because I really believe in it. And it's, it gives you a good feeling. And it's also really exciting and nice. It's a positive and it's really great to meet people. Um, I have much more awareness of the Teo Delft campus. And we see each faculty has their own kind of culture, too. There's really differences. So it's also interesting. Um, so it's, it's really uh, enjoyable. And I also have a team which I built up and I, I really believe strongly like in self-empowerment, giving people all the <laughs> not hierarchical <laughs> and flat. And so I also get a chance in, in our little group to kind of practice what I, what I believe in and, uh, and that works. So I'm happy with that as well, just on a personal level. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, well, as already indicated, uh, we need to move on. Let's yes. thank uh, David one more time. Thank you. And then our next speaker is going to be Dirk van den Heuvel, who is going to uh, give us a presentation on querying architecture. Uh, no, David, thank you so much for your introduction because uh, I was uh, uh, I came back to the university as a PhD student in 2000, and that was the moment that uh, women emancipation was transformed into diversity poli policies. And I thought as a gay person, oh, that's interesting because then I can join. And uh, so I called someone up uh, uh, on the office th and, and, and uh, so I said, I, I uh, expressed my interest and then it was silent because I said, well, it would be very nice to bring gay issues and all that. And it was silent and I said, well, I don't think that TU Delft is ready for that yet. <laughs> And this was in 2000, you know, so it's, uh, so now we're in 2022. So it's a very different uh, situation and uh, it's amazing to see what sort of policies are now being uh, implemented. Uh, I'm happy to see that change and uh, be part of it. Together with Leon, uh, we're sitting there, we, uh, we, we started at some point around 2015 to uh, discuss our annoyances, irritations with the situation. <laughs> Um, and Anke Muller was here at the time uh, at the board and said, well, you should start through you Delft. And, and, and that's for us how it started. And uh, now, yeah, through all sorts of conversations, et cetera. Now, yeah, I, th I think it's amazing to see how it has broadened and yeah, how we're moving on. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy. Uh, so a change can happen. So this is one of the things that I'm really proud of. Um, I am teaching in the Faculty of Architecture. Uh, I'm the head of the group uh, Architecture and Dwelling. And next to starting little campaigns and actions with the True You Delft, I also thought it has to change on the work floor and in the education situation. Architecture and Dwelling are relatively easy topics to, let's say, queer the curriculum or queer uh, education. 
So I started to ask uh, the students and the staff also to think of who is actually living there in the housing that you build. It's not just an anonymous sort of uh, person who's living there or a nuclear family. It has become much more complicated. And this was more or less implicit always, who is that user? So there was one session and we had bachelor students putting up all their housing projects in Amsterdam West. Uh, they were obliged to do a user profile research and much to my astonishment with hundreds of plants there, they were all, almost all hetero, hetero uh, couples, uh, migrant families. There was one uh, student who dared to, uh, to think of a lesbian couple. So I just blurted out, but where, where are the, <laughs> where is a nice uh, a gay couple uh, living in Amsterdam, <laughs> you know? So there was a gap, uh, I, I would like to say, so for who you build, for who you design, for who you are trained and who the people really are. And to think of how design uh, has to, uh, yeah, interact, respond to the, 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 the how people live. And it's not just uh, gay lifestyles or lesbian lifestyles or queer lifestyles. There are rainbow families, there, yeah, there are broken families, uh, uh, multi-generational ways of living together, etc. So, And it was fairly easy to m bring that change just by making it explicit. And the next step for me was to also dive into the research. Uh, so this came out only uh, last month, Queering Architecture, a book with uh, Bloomsbury. Uh, with international authors and I also contributed to it um, because I thought it can also be uh, yeah, made part of my own research uh, portfolio, so to speak. Where, where are entrances to discuss in another way architecture and to think in another way about design? Um, we did before an issue of the Footprint Journal, a peer-reviewed journal from here from Delft, Delft Architecture Theory Journal, Trans Bodies Queering Spaces. Uh, this goes even back to uh, 2017, which was not so easy to develop, but I'm glad that we uh, uh, did it. And now, yeah, so as I say, there's a kind of motor being set in motion, and uh, I hope it will continue. So what I want to do now is um, to give you a little uh, collation <laughs> about uh, queer architecture, queering architecture, uh, because yeah, I started to dig into the archives, into literature, uh, what are the traces, what are the, the, the possibilities uh, to, to, to actually develop uh, and to rethink architecture and what architects do. Uh, um, how long do I have? Okay. That's serious, <laughs> but I brought in, <laughs> I brought in enough materials. So on this uh, image, you already see the difference in approach. Um, so this is a classic welfare state uh, uh, diagram for who planners and architects work. It's by a famous female uh, uh, planner, Lotte Stambeze, for Rotterdam. You see big uh, families, uh, nuclear family. Uh, families without children, only one child, elderly and single persons. Um, that, that's, that's the limit of uh, lifestyles that you had in the 50s, or at least the limit of lifestyles that uh, the, the planners were thinking of. And this is by an artist architect, Andreas Angelidakis. So it's a bit provocative image, of course, to make the contrast as big as possible. Uh, uh, who is uh, a queer artist architect? And this is a kind of vision for uh, a new sort of... Uh, Bad, he calls it a studio space uh, for other lifestyles. But clearly you all can already see that moving back into history, there are tons of traces for queer lifestyles. Uh, go this way. Yeah. Now in the 90s, uh, there was a first wave of uh, studies into this topic. What is queer space? What can it be? Uh, by Aaron Betsky, who also became the director of the Architecture Institute in Rotterdam. And this guy, uh, Joel uh, Sanders, he edited this uh, very, <laughs> at least the cover is very provocative, the architect, some sort of fierce muscular god or hero, uh, architects of masculinity. Um, this was mid-90s uh, and was almost like a coming out for architecture. There are other ways of looking at architecture than through a heteronormative lens. Um, 
Joel moved on to, eh, because this is the moment that queer space, and it's now criticized, that queer space is actually, as described here, way too much the white gay male from New York, because these guys, Aaron and uh, Joel, both uh, were living in New York. And Joel developed a whole sort of research into um, gender inclusive toilets, as he says, not gender neutral, but gender inclusive. Um, with a trans artist, with a judicial person, uh, and we invite him also over to Delft to talk about how so-called non-compliant bodies, how they are treated in space. So not just a normalized body, which has a certain size and is healthy, etc., but people also in wheelchairs, uh, people who don't uh, identify as either male or female, uh, and also uh, mothers uh, with young children, how to, how to accommodate them in space, in architecture. So fantastic projects on um, uh, inclusive toilets, uh, very sensitive. Another uh, pioneer is Henry Urbach. He uh, died, unfortunately, and he, uh, very young, um, he looked into the topic of the closet. And the closet coming out of the closet immediately explains maybe why there is a relationship between architecture, space, and thinking of hidden identities and hidden stories. So yeah, I'm an architect, So, but this is, these are the closets. And these closets, of course, are often overlooked, but anything that's put in the closet is, goes there for a reason to make the other space operable, uh, to hide and to cover up is in function of a certain system. And to get things out of the closet, uh, to make them visible, uh, is part of the transformation, even disruption of that system, I would say. And that system is not just the way we are in the, in the university, but it's the system also of spaces, of houses, of cities. This is the core uh, uh, claim for uh, uh, queer studies in architecture. There's tons of examples of safe spaces uh, in architecture history. This is uh, a famous example of Horace Gifford, uh, Fire Island close to New York, uh, where uh, gay and New York, we will see a lot of gay male uh, uh, houses because they have more money than uh, lesbians or, 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 or trans people. Uh, this is, I will talk a little bit about it later. Um, you, uh, uh, Dave already mentioned intersectionality. This, this is one of the methods to further develop this story and indeed expand this notion of inclusivity and diversity. So it's beautiful architecture, it's much loved, it's modern, it's very hardcore modern architecture. I will show several, uh, so, so queer architecture or queer space is not related to one style, but what you might think of as, now yeah, that is, uh, some people will say that some uh, forms of architecture are feminine and others are masculine. But what you'll see is that in relation to the users and the clients and the designers and how they identify, there are tons of different meanings and values attached to it. Uh, a very uh, well-known example is also the Bloomsbury Group in London uh, with artists and writers like uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, but also uh, the famous uh, economist uh, John Maynard Keynes, of course. Uh, there's the example of Derek Jarman, for instance, the filmmaker and artist who created a very special place, a kind of uh, refuge almost out of the city with a special uh, garden uh, close to the sea. Um, and there's, for instance, this guy, um, Philip Johnson. He's very important in the history of modern architecture. He was a uh, curator at the Modern, uh, uh, modern uh, Museum of Art, the MoMA. Um, Museum of Modern Art, uh, and an architect himself, um, but he's also a bit um, a dangerous person. In the 30s he was uh, supporting uh, the Nazis, uh, a fascist, and after the war he would reinvent himself as a, a supporter of uh, democratic values. But here you see this architecture, a glass house, 
uh, about transparency, uh, functionality, uh, hard surfaces. And this became a kind of safe space for um, gay New York and gay architects and gay architects, for instance, Andy Warhol. Um, Philip Johnson himself was also an art collector and contributed his whole collection to the MoMA. And what was special about him is even though he was definitely a, a right-wing person, he was out because he was so rich that no one could touch him. <laughs> and in that sense, he became also an activist for his love. So you, so you get all sorts of combination when you go through the history and, and traces of persons and biographies, how people navigated yeah, the obstacles of, uh, of having a different lifestyle, a deviant, non-compliant lifestyle and love, uh, right? It's, it's simply about who you want to be with and who you want to have uh, in a relationship, yeah. As I said, there are very few uh, female examples, uh, lesbian examples. Um, I also work um, at a new institute in Rotterdam, uh, which was the Architecture Institute, and we have the National Collection of uh, architecture there and we queer the collection as we say so we organize queer salons and other sort of uh, interventions with artists people from outside architecture uh, looking for those hidden stories and then we do find some um, uh, male examples uh, who can uh, can be both an insider and an outsider i will end with a few of those examples very beautiful houses and interiors and very few female designs. So already in our collection, uh, which is about 700 uh, dossiers, 700 archives, uh, mostly author-based, and most of them are male-authored. There's up to 10, 20 female-authored uh, uh, dossiers in a whole uh, collection of uh, 700 dossiers. And then they are often couples uh, with a, a husband and wife uh, office or practice. There's only one we identified. Only, yeah, it's a bit silly to identify those people, but it's the only way to try and work this visibility uh, strategy. So uh, Riek Bakker, who's an urban designer, uh, she's famous for the, her policies in uh, Rotterdam. She's uh, out and proud uh, lesbian, also uh, often at the COC in Rotterdam. Uh, but we only have a few items of her work, but other than that, uh, you know, it's not there. So, speaking of intersectionality, uh, we're going to organize uh, a salon on queer and crip uh, to see what's happening there, or black and queer, uh, also in relation to our archive. Um, and it's a, it's a tough method because it's almost self-defeating because you bring out what is not there the absences and we hope what we want to do is that from those absences that we can start working on different ways of creating a, an ex inclusive uh, environment um, in the institute and in our work. So I show here Eileen Gray, Irish French uh, architect, she's a heroine uh, of uh, modernism, two books uh, that look at her work, uh, try to also rethink modern architecture and avant-garde architecture here. Here she is with a very classy photo. Uh, beautiful uh, little house uh, uh, at the Mediterranean coast in France. Um, there's always little fights and contestations in these histories because she was also involved uh, with a guy. Uh, but she's more or less also appropriated by, uh, uh, especially uh, with uh, Jasmine's book, uh, Aline Gray in the Design of Sapphic Modernity. Uh, yeah, to, and she was in Paris, uh, yeah, uh, a well-known guest in the lesbian salons there. Uh, so with this, let's say, autobiographical uh, background, she, she's, yeah, a lesbian icon. And beautiful stuff, you can still buy the furniture. <laughs> it's, it's a luxury modernist uh, uh, design. And one of the things, and this is what I want to bring here in terms of safe spaces, so this is architecture, you look at the plan and how the plan controls the spaces. Uh, for outsiders of architecture, plans are often very hard to read. Uh, but the core uh, tenets of modernism and this new avant-gardist, well, this is a kind of legacy of modernism here, it's about transparency, looking out, you know, it's immediate uh, uh, 
relationship with the outside, inside, outside, almost no uh, 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 obstacles there. But the scholars of the work of Eileen Gray, but also other uh, uh, queer uh, designers, show how this transparency ID uh, and the ID of uh, unhindered connections is replaced by a continuous negotiation who controls the space and how the space is safe for another way of life. So here you see there's, there's, there's uh, invisibility, you control who can look in and how to look out. And yeah, in this plan, yeah, it's, I don't know if it's, this is maybe for the students. So he, here you see how the stairs work and the doors work and they work like a, also a closet. So when one door opens, you see that one uh, connection is blocked, uh, etc. So, and you never ever get to enter the main space, just like that, as you do here. <laughs> There's always a series of, let's say, thresholds and filters before you really enter the center space and the, 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 the space of privacy, uh, which is, yeah, it's a very lush, uh, uh, yeah, m uh, modernist, and you could say even with all the beds and the luxury materials, a very erotic kind of uh, scenography. Um, a very different approach is in postmodern architecture, uh, which embraces uh, crazy forms, uh, which uh, thinks of eclecticism as very important. Uh, ornaments come back. And this is the first time that a historian acknowledges a gay kind of undercurrent. So <laughs> until then, it's really not mentioned at all. And Charles Jenks uh, mentions it here and there, but really briefly, uh, he doesn't theorize it, and you get things like this. Uh, Charles Moore, uh, very uh, theatrical. Um, this is in uh, ooh, uh, now Minneapolis in America. Uh, he created also these kind of interiors, but this is with a graphic designer, very colorful, uh, very bright, uh, away from the modernism, but again, uh, with all sorts of different ways of connecting spaces and controlling spaces. This was also his private home, away from the city. So, again, a kind of safe space uh, for him. Now we move to uh, Amsterdam, to the Netherlands. <laughs> this was the space of um, Frans Hax, the director of the Groningen Museum. Uh, what how to say it, uh, an relnicht, an, an you say in Dutch. <laughs> a very expressive, articulated person uh, who made sure that the Groningen Museum, designed by Mendini, got built. Uh, but here he lived with his partner after he retired. And you can already tell uh, that this is the entry uh, of the house that there is in the... Uh, this is not just a very... Uh, careful masking and filtering, no, it's very obviously this is a, a closed off space, right? You don't enter here just like that. You cannot look inside. Only when the door opens, you get a little peak uh, view inside. And this is then his little temple, very bright, very colorful. Uh, Mendini, uh, who designed this museum, I, I think you know it, it's a fantastic place to go. Uh, and it was a present for Franz Hax to design these spaces. It's, it's over the top, with a bathtub uh, in the middle, uh, etc. Uh, so it's not anymore this, this, this uh, very sophisticated modernism, but in your face. Um, it's now a monument. It's, the interior is listed as a monument, and it was bought by a, an American couple who loved it. Yeah. Um, and here you see, yeah, again, plans. Um, here you see, this is the street space. And here you see there's a very thick sort of zone that you have to penetrate before you uh, come inside. And here are some of the drawings of Mendini, the theatrical mask or facade, the closing off of that uh, interior. And here you have uh, that, that very theatrical space with the stairs here, but there's also a sneaky stairs here next to it, moving up to a much more normal space where he lived with his partner. 
So it's also a double fate sort of house, and it's very different from uh, yeah the classic welfare state uh, nuclear family house or t- uh, yeah, a doors on voning. It's not like that at all. But two entry space uh, entry is uh, one of the classic tricks to create a very different sort of way of living there. Oh, here you see these um, sections. So here, this is downstairs with all sorts of theatrical lighting, and here you go up to the more normal space. Um, someone you also may know is uh, Benno Premsela, a designer um, and an activist, uh, one of the founders of the COC, with his partner Friso Broeksma, who was an architect, uh, also teaching here in Delft. He also created this safe space uh, in this house, uh, Kaisersgracht. And again, there's a kind of uh, scenography or uh, filters, thresholds before you come in. So you had to walk across this uh, art piece by Karl André. Uh, so, so, so there's a moment, there's a ritual there, and then you go up the stairs before you enter this special space, which is like a little temple for modernist uh, design, which was also like a salon where all sorts of friends and colleagues uh, would come together and uh, Benno Premsler and Friso Broeksma would host uh, all sorts of guests. The Jew, actually, the Jewish Museum uh, put up a whole uh, interesting uh, exhibition on his work at the time. Now, three ones from the archive in Rotterdam. This this is um, um, uh, Onno Greiner, a theater architect, very successful. And uh, he was open about his uh, uh, homosexuality, uh, but he talked about his struggles with his father, etc. And he created this house, a patio house. Yeah, it's all drawings, um, which is very private. And I, I try to explain why it's so different, because I mentioned the doors on Woning, uh, het Rijtjeshuis, uh, terraced housing, the row house, and it's a very Dutch tradition to have your front door straight to the street. Uh, it's in Paris or Berlin or other places, you know, there's all sorts of different ways of living in a, in a city. But in the Netherlands, the front door at the street is very important. And, and this cluster of patio houses has a very different relationship to that public street. So all sorts of social control disappear. And the cluster is made in such a way that you cannot even recognize the individual house and you cannot really recognize where the entry is. So the, he had a younger partner uh, who lives there still, uh, and he told us, I uh, went there with uh, one of my uh, colleagues, he told us how this way of living there allowed him and Ono a certain privacy there, right? Because no one could look inside, etc. In Amstelveen, actually, just outside Amsterdam. The other one I'd like to show is uh, Wim den Boom. He's the most anarchist one. Um, the keurige leugens van het officieel fatsoen. So he really liked to uh, uh, yeah, uh, go against the grain. Um, and he created a whole sort of, he was a single person, uh, very colorful life. We, we think of maybe he should have a biography or something. Um, he dressed up uh, in leather, uh, um, fancy outfits, etc. also to more or less, no, not to shock, but, be, but to create his own space, so to say. And he loved to travel in Europe and uh, hike uh, and uh, embraced uh, nudism. So in the photo album, you also get to see him. Uh, uh, I, I have no idea why he did that, we don't know. But in these photos, uh, he becomes really his own person. Uh, because he had a, yeah, he was, you could say his career did not come off the ground because of his uh, different way of life and his uncompromising way of life. But he did a few very experimental houses that we have in the archive that are very unlike anything else that um, modernist or functionalist housing in the Netherlands uh, has. So, eh, as you remember, the first image with uh, the diagram uh, where who, sh- who should go where. In the 50s, 60s, maybe up to the 70s, functionalism was very strong in the Netherlands. 
and to think of architecture as a space to experiment, to come up with a, a narrow house, as in this case, uh, or other co kind of houses. It's a set of like a dozen houses. This is the 60s. It's, it's quite unique. And it's an autobiographical house because you can see there's a sports car. He loved sports cars. There's a canoe. He loved canoeing, etc. And again, there's a kind of labyrinth that creates a safe space for him and that creates interior spaces inside interior spaces. So how you move through it and how this space is then enveloped by other spaces is very typical uh, of this approach. Um, now, beautiful drawings. Uh, definitely not a family house with children. Here are other uh, house, uh, yeah, beautiful models also that we have. A holiday home. And here you see very clearly how it's uh, closed off to the outside. And there's uh, an idea about the interior uh, that also has a different uh, material and surface treatment. Now, the last person, um, also a mysterious guy, Dick van Voorkom, who was an architect, but also founder of our collection. Uh, he was into art and the style in the 50s and 60s. Uh, he died in the 80s. And he worked with someone called Balieu, an artist. Beautiful sculptural things. Um, so here's the sculpture. Um, the model is done by Balieu and the drawing is by Dick van Voorkom. And he too also engaged in very experimental uh, sort of uh, spatial constructions. Uh, and fictional houses. So this is a house for uh, uh, a special friend, Frank den Oudste. Um, and he created a kind of what, what was called a paper architecture, a kind of space of freedom for architecture and architects outside building practice. And here you can I show these, these two plans look very much alike. They're very funny. So you look for traces in the, <laughs> what could be queer, what could be gay. So this says, a uh, woonhuis for a gemiddeld gezin. Uh, MV, twee kinderen. So a house for an ordinary uh, family, uh, male, female, two kids. And you see the four uh, bedrooms. But when you look, it's not quite ordinary or <laughs> because they have all these bathrooms. And then the other one um, is the same plan. And then it says a house for an art collector. And the moment you uh, come across these signs, an art collector or a musician or an artist, you know oh, something else is happening. <laughs> so you get to know all these little signs that, oh, we, we're moving aside from the path and, that, uh, and, and we come into something else that is not really explicit. And you see this becomes, yeah, a guest home or I, I don't know what, but, uh, but definitely, definitely not a nuclear family. And then he has all these, uh, yeah, very uh, sculptural and artistic kind of houses, and also a special way of drawing, very beautiful, very abstract. Uh, and you see, he's very much into the style and primary colors and uh, elementary space. Now, and to close off with his, this is so. So he he would never talk about him being gay. He was the director of what was then the precursor to the Architecture Institute. But there was never ever, uh, you know, no one would come to his uh, private home, for instance. Uh, we talked with uh, contemporaries. Uh, the w partners were not allowed to enter somehow the official world. Uh, and this is his private house or designs that he made for his private house. And it's a crazy house. It's like a, a house for four different people or for four different uh, characters uh, that create another labyrinth. These models were made by students later. Um, where is the right image? Yeah, yeah. here you see, and these, these are all stairs. Here's a piano, of course. Uh, there are sleeping spaces, meeting spaces. And it creates, again, a fantastic labyrinth uh, or a playroom or a playground, but you're never quite sure um, what you're looking at, what sort of space it really is, uh, the kind of the essence always uh, escapes you in a way, uh, which is very much part of this queer theory thing that there's an aspect of escaping uh, 
uh, essential meanings because there's yeah uh, there's this 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 strategy of hiding uh, and playing with different uh, persona so this is a nice image to stop with so you get a you get a mask again a filter an image behind all sorts of things happen and you get a little peek sometimes what is behind it but you never get to know uh, the full story so <laughs> This is this is part of the research uh, I'm looking into now. So thank you. Thank you, Dirk. <laughs> well, there's of course uh, time for questions. Also, the people online, uh, you can use the Q and A to ask questions. Uh, your question will be read out loud. If there's any, I will look at my colleague AJ for that. So, first in the room, are there any questions? Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, it raises a lot of questions, <laughs> I must say, uh, to me. Um, but I, I think my main question is, um, in, in, in your uh, college, yeah. um, you, you show us examples from the past in which individuals try to hide away from the open yeah. and from the public space. And, well, that's my question. Um, I think it's very important to be visible uh, as well yeah. uh, and to be part of that public space as yeah, well yeah. as, as a, a queer community. Yeah. Um, in, to, to what point um, have you seen examples or ideas about how we can be visible and safe as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very good question. Um, yeah, there's... In, in this discourse or research field, uh, there's different ways of looking at things. So th this is very much now focusing on private houses, but there's also a lot of uh, research on public spaces, what's happening in public spaces, bars, for instance, and clubs, or the salons. Um, we had one a very interesting discussion about it uh, when we organized a seminar on this, and there was uh, an architect of a, a gay, um, yeah, they called themselves gay, uh, a gay woon group, uh, a collective. They wanted to build their own house, uh, collective house, about 12 apartments, because they wanted to take care of one another when growing older. Uh, the Halle, the pink, the rose Halle, it's called, and uh, it was super interesting because the inhabitants had exactly this discussion: should we be visible from the outside, or should we somehow be invisible because we might be attacked or bad things may happen, uh, etc. So, and they solved it by creating a kind of art piece. Uh, so with the balconies, uh, they created a special sort of, uh, yeah, they brought in an artist who would think about this balance between visible and invisible. So the house itself became a little bit different from the other houses. But if you wouldn't know, it was just a special art kind of treatment. But uh, for some, it would signal, oh yes, that's the special... Uh, uh, a woon group living there, the, uh, the gay collective, and for others who wouldn't know it, it would be just uh, yeah anonymous. So yeah, and this is this is really part of the balance, yeah, yeah. But I don't think there's a rule for it. I think it's really up to uh, to yourself if you want to be out and visible all the time, or also have a possibility to uh, say at some point, ma, <laughs> maybe I I want to stay inside. Yeah. Do you have a suggestion? That would also be great. <laughs> what, what I see is that we have that flag uh, sometimes ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. on our houses, um, yeah. but it's only on, on special days. Yeah. And, and, well, I think public space should be safe space for everyone. Yeah. yeah. So how can we make that inclusive? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the main question. Yeah. And, and not yeah. and not easy to answer. No, no, no. Um, no, so yeah, I don't have the answer, but it's absolutely a, a concern and a topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there more questions? So it's super interesting. Um, I'm, we sort of started around like the 1930s. Has there been anything prior to that? I mean, ancient cultures yeah. were very yeah. open, particularly yeah. around different sections. 
Is there anything that sort of like that was sort of in terms of design and architecture that has either disappeared or flowed on to architectural queering the space yeah. in like 2022? Yeah. I don't know the whole history, but but there are there are some there are some of these projects. Uh, uh, so in England, uh, in Britain, uh, there is, for instance, a fantastic project by Historic England, where people tell their own stories and bring. Um, so the citizen science comes in at this point often, and they uh, but but are examples indeed of of earlier Victorian England, but also going back to well in the Netherlands we have the the the, the yeah the golden age the Renaissance in Amsterdam was a very uh, tolerant place for, uh, for for I think mostly for uh, gay male people, but, but but how that relates to architecture I must say I don't know, but. Uh, Maybe Leon wants no. <laughs> ah, okay. I have another question. Um, well, the, the the buildings that you show me really puzzle me, and they are exciting. But I think you can only understand them really if you also understand how the open space around it, the gardens, mm. are um, designed. Yeah. As it may be yeah. open towards the environment, but then the garden is a safe space as well. Yeah. So yeah. Don't only look to. The concrete things, or yeah. the walls, etc. Yeah. But look how it's positioned in the environment. And I think sometimes you can have a very safe space. Normally in the Dutch context, the gardens, neighbors can yeah. have a look in it. Yeah. But if you have a courtyard yeah. inside, it's very safe. Yeah. And um, the, the function of that may be, well, can be very different. Now, yeah, this is, the, this is the example of Onno Greiner. Um yeah, it's what I only showed. We have all, I, I, I didn't. Yeah. You are. The, the uh, all the images. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And they are very. You feel obvious are have another. Oh, yeah, the little courts. Yeah, yeah. They were also for single women, also like safe spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't know. No. <laughs> In individual women living there <laughs> who might be into all sorts of relationships. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. I saw a question somewhere over there. Yeah. But I think the, the notion of safe space is, is, is a very nice notion to, to look at all sorts of uses in the city and all, all sorts of buildings and clusters of buildings that, that indeed house communities or groups of people. It, it's, it's very... Uh, very interesting. Hi. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I think I have a small question regarding the expanding this uh, house-based querying to the querying of communities or the querying of uh, urban scale uh, public spaces maybe. So how do we expand? Ah, yeah. yeah. And, and also like how do we envision for the next 50 years? How do we... Prom uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, now after all these years, I, I think there will always be a kind of play uh, or game happening between inside and outside. I mean, it's a super useful tool to understand what's happening. And it, of course, it's uh, in many of those examples, it was a different time, much more hostile. And, and now I, I hope it's much more an, a matter of choice, an option. Uh, because there will always be a desire for privacy and 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 uh, yeah, and not people not having to look in, but also to then reach out. Um, and there are these, uh, there are the moments of the festival uh, of the event, like the the pride or the and in Amsterdam the uh, canal pride, of course, which is one of those moments that a, a city space or a public space completely transforms. And this. Yeah, this is, and these are temporary changes, but I also think that through the festival and the event uh, in the city or, or in the street, um, they really bring about transformation in cities and communities. I mean, th this, this is why we do it. This is why we parade, of course, <laughs> that we want to make people aware. Oh, yes, and, and now... The canals are not just anymore a space for trading or for heritage, but they have become uh, uh, spaces that we now identify with uh, emancipation and progress of the of queer community. So, so yeah, these meanings and values they change, and we can appropriate these spaces. Uh, I would say, yeah, 
Yeah, so it's not, it's, it's, there are brick spaces, concrete spaces, but it doesn't mean that they have only one meaning. I think, and yeah, and as you say, yeah, so many of you, that visibility is absolutely part of it, yeah. yeah. yeah and events and festivals and parties, <laughs> they help in creating visibility, yeah. Looking at the time, we have time for yeah. one more question. Okay. <laughs> uh, most of these are for fancy houses. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, I know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what is current current situation for building houses for the queer community? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. So, in this in this intersectionality debate, uh, we often forget about class. Right, uh, people with uh, much less money, uh, less um, support from uh, family or their uh, environment. This is an under-researched uh, uh, field. Uh, there are a few uh, researchers who look into uh, squatters' movements, um, into um, um, gay communities and gay, I mean, in the broader sense. Uh, in Australia, I found, uh, I went to Australia in an exchange for a visiting scholarship. And it's, yeah, it's a settler's culture, right? Uh, so there's this, this space, and so people move out of the city to create their own communities. And there's examples of gay and lesbian communities who build their own spaces out of nothing. Uh, there's not not middle class money, <laughs> not fancy houses, but it, it's very rare. It's true, and this class issue: where is where is an yeah the the person who doesn't have money? Where is he in this space? So it becomes the story of appropriating spaces. And in in London, a colleague of mine looked into um, a, a trans community, very little money, and they managed to. Yeah, create a club and a meeting space. So the whole idea of architecture changed. It was not designed anymore. It was user controlled and the user became an architect in that sense by appropriating the space to the needs of their own community. And that's a way of looking at architecture uh, as uh, that's very different from the classic engineer. Um, so I often say we have to bring in a radical user perspective and, and much more radical than we now think. And, and that's, but that's something that's, yeah, we need to look more into this, yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Dirk, for the very nice presentation. And also thank you for the nice questions. Uh, now we have uh, a coffee break. Oh, let's thank him again. Sorry. Now we have a coffee break and I would suggest that we continue the program at 10 past 3. Great, because I would like to uh, announce our next uh, speaker, uh, Professor Andy van der Dobbelsteen, who is here uh, to tell us more actually about uh, how you do the energy transition in the built environment. So I would mm -hmm. like to give uh, the floor to you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and thanks for inviting me. Um, apart from professor teaching architecture students how to design sustainable buildings, um, I'm also a sustainability coordinator of TU Delft, so busy with the whole transition here on the campus to become carbon neutral and circular and climate adaptive. But I won't focus too much on that, but in the handout that I will provide, there will be also extra slides you can watch of what we are doing. Um, I, I, I primarily want to focus on climate change and how that actually hits us all um, and what we can do about it. Um, I don't think that there's any distinction between people when you talk about climate change. There is a distinction, but I will get to back to that later. Uh, what is it that we have to, f to be aware of? What will change and what is already changing is, for instance, more extreme weather. If you ask insurance companies, they can tell you that uh, there is an increase of damage that uh, is caused by storms and hills and, and, uh, and of course, indirect uh, effects. What we have not experienced so much in Holland yet is forest fires. Not too bad, luckily. But we can imagine that um, if, we, if we had had just one person in the Veluwe last summer, 
who would have uh, spilled some some of its uh, coals in 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 the forest and it would have gone up completely in flames because it was so dry that it would have completely burnt out and then we would have noticed that the Netherlands actually is a very dense country uh, uh with even more problems if this happens than in Portugal, like this one. Um, but we should be aware of this. This is a serious thing, and it's related, of course, to temperatures. Um, we know already that uh, even in the Netherlands now, 40 degrees is becoming almost common, I would say, in summertime, especially towards 2050. This was the, the record year, uh, 2019, when... Um, this uh, maximum temperature of 40.7 was measured. When I was young, uh, 36 was about the maximum that you could get in summertime. Um, and what not many people realize is that actually these temperatures are always measured outside the city, not within the city. And we know uh, at the same time that from satellite imagery that cities are much hotter than the rural countryside. So um, I, I was born in Tilburg, which is very close to Gilserijen. This is a military airport, so open fields, a lot of green. Um, and Tilburg is a very stony, laborous city, uh, which must have been 48 degrees. That's Indian temperatures almost, and that makes city hardly livable anymore. Um, so um, that's a problem. Why is this? It's because of the urban heat island effect. It's a natural phenomenon, uh, primarily uh, related to the sun, Sun being absorbed by stone, by tarmac, by bitumen, and then heating up the city uh, later uh, in the evening. But we have an increasing amount of anthropogenic heat, as I call it. So that's heat released by uh, vehicles, by equipment, and also by air conditioners. Because air conditioners can be very nice for yourself, cooling down your city, your building, but you're blowing out warm air to your neighbors who then also have to uh, install an air conditioning unit. So that's that's a dangerous thing. And of course, here up in the north, we, we have few cities that have been designed for higher temperatures. We are mainly designed for cold winters. And now this is changing. And um, we shouldn't be surprised about these high temperatures in cities, because if you go to a higher space somewhere on the roof then, and look around, then you understand why all these cities heat up so easily. You have uh, bitumen, you have uh, 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 roof tiles, you have uh, steel plates, and they all become really hot when the sun is shining. Um, bitumen, for instance, can heat up to 80 degrees when in the middle of summer. Um, and then you can have a lot of thermal insulation, but the, the space underneath will still be hot. So uh, this is uh, we, we need to bring back nature again in cities to reverse that effect. So green actually is a natural air conditioner, and... Uh, apart from all the other functions, which I will address later, I think it's very important to, to start becoming understanding. Here in Delft, we should become engineers that understand green and ecology again, and, and uh, not just think in technical materials. What we will also uh, encounter more is floods. This, this was uh, in the summer of 2021. Um, South Limburg in the Netherlands, uh, Belgium and Germany were worse. Um, and I always say, if this torrential rainfall that happened in that area of Europe, if it would have been here in the West, close to The Hague and Rotterdam, I think we would have had a totally different climate policy. Because we haven't felt the pain here in the West, and politicians haven't. And of course, yeah, it was bad for Limburg, but Limburg economically is not as important as Rotterdam and The Hague and everything else here. So I think maybe we need a, a small nut too, too strong uh, disaster to make people aware here in The Hague that, that we really have to do something about it. Um, and already 15 years ago, there were plans to make our cities much wetter in the sense that uh, uh, rain and other, uh, uh, other forms of uh, precipitation, that they could be better stored in cities. Uh, and, and then if you would have a period of drought, which we have more often nowadays, that there will still be some water for the plants and to be used by humans. Um, in the same time, there was a lot of ideas of water ar architecture. So um, if we create more water, we can also build different buildings that, that can actually float and, and, uh, uh, and that can go inside together with a wetter country like we should be perhaps again. And I was myself involved in a study 
voor de Zuidplas polder. Dat is de diepest polder in de Netherlands at the moment. It's between Rotterdam, Zoetermeer en en Gouda. Um, about seven meters below sea level at the deepest point. And there were plans to extend the existing villages and cities. And um, But uh, the ministry was aware that uh, there would be a flood risk <laughs> in, in our changing climate. So civil engineers calculated the flood risk would be 1.3 meter once every 100 years, for what it's worth. 100 years could also be tomorrow. <laughs> um, But we thought, well, oh, let's let's take it as a nice design assignment and and design buildings that can actually be safe up to that flood. So that's here you see a few typologies, and uh, of course you see some ancient ones, uh, the the ones on uh, the buildings, houses on molds, the houses on on poles, um, a floodable carport, the upfloating house. But I I think it's also very nice to think about uh, what are resistant walls. Um, we can easily make this, and then your house is still safe, and you make it a nice split level dwelling. Or aquarium glass, <laughs> and then you see a different biotope uh, when there's a flood. Um, we can also create mini polders, um, but then of course you're being shut off from the world when there's a flood. So it needs to have a basement actually, a cellar with uh, food <laughs> or a boat <laughs> that should be alongside. But it was just to show that we can also take this climate challenge in a positive way and, and think creatively about solutions. Um, <laughs> At the moment, <laughs> they're actually constructing the extensions of the villages, and they do it in a traditional way. So it's uh, it's traditional housing, not safe up for flooding at all. Um, so basically, what what policy politics do is they choose for damage afterwards and for a lot of costs related to uh, uh, sort of converting that damage into s in, and, rep and repairing things. Whereas we could have also chosen for this, buildings that are 10% more expensive, but are, that are completely safe. It's a choice. Um, in cities that uh, itself, uh, we should also retain rainwater much better. Uh, and we can do that, for instance, by storing much more on roofs, by making uh, green-blue roofs, uh, polder roofs or uh, sponge roofs that can absorb a lot of rainfall and, and keep it there for a longer time. Or when that's not possible, we can uh, solve it on the ground floor. Um, Rotterdam has this world's uh, uh, premiere of, uh, of uh, water squares that are normally dry, but in, in, in heavy rainfall gradually fill up and then become a playground for kids to play with water. Uh, they love it. So I think it's a very smart way to, to deal with uh, water because if you don't do this, then you flush it to the river and then it will create floods elsewhere. Um, so we need to keep it as long as possible. And of course it helps um, when there's a drought again afterwards to, to have uh, a storage of water. So I think we should start preparing buildings for a different climate, for the climate of 2004 to 50, because everything we build now or we renovate will still be there in 2050. So we need to be ready for that. Uh, I mentioned this already. Another thing is that, well, Maybe we should learn for warmer, from warmer climates and how people used to build there in the past when they didn't have technology, when they didn't have a lot of money to in, in import things. Um, and maybe use that architectural types more in our country and then make it our own. Um, not many people assume that the Netherlands actually is quite cold still. <laughs> Even with climate change, we, we have an average temperature of how much? Do you know that? 15, that's what most people think. 11. It's 11 degrees at the moment, which is already 2 degrees warmer than 1900, when it was 9 degrees. Um, and we are expected to, to increase till 13. But if you talk to, to people from Southern Europe or Asia, they think like, wow, <laughs> that's really cold. <laughs> um, so we don't need our air conditioners, actually. We should use our soil, because our soil has the average temperature of the year. Um, so if you dig into the soil two meters, then it's very stable around 11 degrees. So you have free cooling if we use the soil. Um, and this building is using the soil, actually. It has foundation piles that have uh, tubes in them and that exchange heat with the underground. So now we're using, actually, the summer heat that was stored when it was nearly 40 degrees in summer. And it's additional heating now for the ventilation system that is already you, uh, coming in with a moderate temperature because of the phase change materials. So it's a very smart building, this one. This is the most sustainable building at the, on the campus at the moment. 
So not echo. Echo is energy producing, but it's actually not. <laughs> this one is. <laughs> um, anyway, heat pump systems are a good solution because heat pumps can cool and heat, and that's what we need in our changing climate. Um, and it's a better solution than having a boiler on gas and having an air conditioner. Um, but we should not install uh, air-to-air -air heat pumps too much because air-to-air -air heat pumps are the same as air conditioners. They blow out warm air in summertime and then we're heating up the city again. So using the soil, using water is better and I will explain that later also. Um, use more green, that's also what I mentioned of course and create biodiversity. There will be places on Earth and this is uh, Palermo on Sicily where more severe measures are me uh, needed and, and that's related because Palermo was 50 degrees during two consecutive summers already. Um, that makes the city completely uninhabitable. Uh, what you can do, a technical solution, is actually make squares and, and, and roads, uh, uh, lay piping in them, uh, push cold water through it, and the water collects the solar heat, and then you store the solar heat for uh, in the underground for winter time. And then you're actually cooling the city and creating a heat source for winter time or for other hot water purposes. Um, so I think we, we, we need to become smarter also to help uh, the areas in the world that are becoming uninhabitable gradually. So yes, climate change will hit us all, um, but the impact is actually not divided equally or righteously, you could say, because the poorest regions in the world are suffering most. Um, so rich and poor, there's a difference, but also between women and men. Because especially in Africa, where climate change is also hitting harder than here, uh, it's usually women that have to get the water for the families. So they have to walk long distances. It's very difficult to get it, and it's getting worse. So I think those who are responsible, and let's face it, we in the Western world are responsible more than other parts, um, we should help others. Uh, so solidarity is very important. Now, the great sustainability challenge, therefore, of course, is related to climate adaptiveness, to make the built environment also carbon neutral. Um, circular is an important one, and then adding value. I will shortly go into it. So, climate adaptation I mentioned. Carbon neutral, we need to become as, that as soon as possible. And not for ourselves, but for future generations. If we, if we quit emitting CO2 today, then we will still have the impact of what we did till yesterday for 50 to 75 years because of the degradation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's very slow. Um, now I made a MOOC, I'm not going to show this film, uh, but um, it, it was a film uh, that actually explains in a very simple and funny way how much energy we actually use in, in households um, if we would have to generate that energy by ourselves, for instance, through rowing on rowing machines that can produce electricity. It's a very funny film, so you can watch it on YouTube, just look for Energy Slaves. Um, and it was made actually for a, a MOOC, a massive open online course that also teaches uh, people who, across the world how to design or redesign uh, uh, zero energy buildings. Um, it's open right now, it's, it's for free, so if you're interested, then you can uh, have a look on site. There's also people also always following that, uh, that have their own home and want to make their home more energy efficient, so they can also watch it. Um, the main idea behind that uh, approach to zero energy buildings is that uh, you should always first understand the local circumstances, the climate, the underground, the surroundings, the ecology and then start to think about reducing, reusing, or producing energy or other resources. Um, and reducing the demand is, is actually the most effective step. And I'm, I'm sort of sad about the whole development around uh, the terrible war in Ukraine that um, the focus of our government has mainly been on, okay, how are we going to import gas from other parts of the world instead of thinking like, okay, let's try to push a lot of put a lot of money into saving energy in the built environment and to, to actually reduce the bill in that sense for, uh, for people. Uh, this is my own messy kitchen. Uh, so you see, we have so many equipment, we have so many much stuff that, that is using energy that um, we can do a lot there. Um, also important, step two, heat recovery from ventilated air. I was talking to Dirk about this. <laughs> Doesn't always work well, but um, this is quite common at the moment. And also shower water 
of course, runs away with 35 degrees or 40 degrees, and we're not reusing it again. Uh, and then systems now that can actually recover that heat. But much more interesting is uh, the, the urban scale. We have many functions in the city, uh, many different buildings that all have a different energy pattern. If you look at uh, the bars, uh, which is the use of heat, cold and electricity per square meter. And instead of looking at buildings separately, we should actually thinking about connecting and exchanging energy between buildings. Because it's very simple. If you, if you are cooling a, a, a building or a, a certain function, like in supermarkets, then you're actually emitting heat all the time. And um, especially with, with uh, uh, supermarkets, that's a stupid thing because they, they need to be in the vicinity of people living, right? And this is a part of Amsterdam. Um, and um, my graduate student, Nick, he looked at uh, connecting the energy systems of both building types, so the, the apartments together with the supermarket. And then uh, by doing that, he could save actually 60% of the carbon emissions without even having to renovate the existing buildings. And that's simply that the, the heat released by the supermarket actually is directly used or stored in the underground and then used in winter time. And that made it so much more efficient because <laughs> there's so much heat coming from that that uh, he could do a lot. Um, if that's not possible within a block, then we can also think about uh, creating uh, networks, heat and cold networks that help to exchange the, the waste heat that normally would be released into the environment. Um, so I think key for sustainability is connecting. And that, that's a nice story because it has many connotations, but um, it's about different buildings, organizations, and within neighborhoods. So I think that a sustainable transition towards these systems will help actually to, to connect people <laughs> much better than rather be separated like we have now. Um, well, and the last step then is to produce your own energy, for instance, solar energy in this case. But if you look at these roofs, this is good, of course, but on the other hand, we also know when this is producing most of the energy. It's when the sun is high, which is in the middle of summer, and it's uh, in the middle of the day. And then in wintertime, it hardly produces anything because the solar panels are vertical, or uh, horizontal, I mean. Um, so then we have another an enormous excess of production in summer, and we have a shortage in winter, so we need storage, but batteries only uh, do that for a short term. Hydrogen loses a lot of energy while doing that, and you need ex uh, different infrastructures. By the way, uh, there are, there's one house here connected to hydrogen as a test case. Um, and we can create e-fuels, but that's in an uh, early stage of doing that. Um, we have the e-refinery project at TU Delft where we are actually making uh, carbon hydrates, so fuels, uh, could be petrol, could be diesel, could be kerosene, from CO2 and, and a lot of electricity. <laughs> so, um, but that's maybe something for the future. I think for now, it's much better to think about supplying your neighbors, helping your neighbors to use electricity when you have too much, uh, or that you design differently. And by that I mean that um, in our country, <laughs> the sun doesn't go very um, much higher than 30, uh, 63 degrees. That's in the middle of summer, 21st of June, 12 o'clock solar time. In winter time, uh, 21st of December, it doesn't get any higher than 15 degrees. So in, in the Netherlands, actually, the sun is more horizontal than it's vertical. That means that we can produce much more energy by using the facades of buildings. And now, of course, this might be considered ugly, <laughs> even though in architecture you should not talk about beautiful or ugly. But um, the advantage is if you do this on the eastern side, you have sun in, in the morning. On the west side, you have uh, electricity in the, e in, in the evening when you get home, because nobody is there in the middle of the day. Um, and, and panels that are on the roof, they produce most in the middle of the day when you are out working or when you're going to school, so it's not a smart solution. But if you have vertical PV on the south, then you have much more production in winter time because the sun is low. So um, I think we should do much more with the facade. And it can be done in a more beautiful way, and I will show that later. Um, so in the meantime, our buildings are becoming more energy efficient. Um, and that means that our carbon emissions because of energy consumption, is going down. And then we forget that we have a lot of building materials and other stuff that, that need to be produced and that generate a lot of en uh, carbon emissions. So building materials are becoming more important than energy. 
at the moment. So we have to work towards uh, circularity because everything is connected. Now, circular construction, short story, there's two ways. We can think about technical materials that are finite and try to reuse them as, as long as possible. Recycle, reuse, reprocess. Um, and the other way is using renewable materials such as wood and using it as long as possible, of course. Uh, maybe cascade it, uh, not cascade it. Um, those are the basic principles of circular construction or production. Um, but also, uh, we are a poor country. We have hardly any useful resources. We have clay, we have some <laughs> plant material. There used to be gas, but it's nearly done. Um, so most of our resources we have in the Netherlands, the valuable resources, are imported from the global south mostly. And now we have it in our city. So we should be careful and, and try to reuse that as much as possible. Um, and then perhaps pay back the Global South for everything they've delivered to us in the past few centuries. Um, and there's new business models that uh, do, not, um, do not assume anymore that you are uh, owner of everything you use, but you are the company that produces it does it, and they have to take it back and recycle it and reuse it again to save energy and to save resources. So that is related to circular procurement, the so-called R ladder, which relates to everything. Here at TU Delft, the biggest carbon emission is coming from procurement of furniture, of equipment, of coffee cups, of building materials for renovation or for new construction, by far. And I think that applies to many organizations. So we have to be really smart about this and think about circular contracts with suppliers because they have to work along with us. So you have to collaborate. We, we don't know how to produce a computer here, even, even though we are uh, a technical university. Um, so the company needs to do that. And another thing, our Faculty of Architecture was actually a beautiful building, the best building here on the campus. Um, our real estate company wants to get rid of it and wants to build a super sustainable new building on the south campus. Well, nobody at architecture wants that. Um, but they think, because of, they think in energy only, that that's the best solution. But this is the forest that we would need to compensate the carbon emissions for the building materials if we would build a new building. And this is if we would completely strip the building of its facade, the infill and the building surfaces, and then make it energy neutral. Even then, this is much smaller than the other one. So renovation and transformation is by far the best solution. Uh, and we will never leave the building. <laughs> um, and in the same story, everybody's now talking in the Netherlands about a million new homes. We need a million new homes because there's shortage of housing, which is true. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have to create a million new houses. Uh, there's a lot of, about 650,000 houses could be created in the existing built environment, in empty buildings, in offices, as top-up apartments, as uh, infills of cities that are, are not used well. So, um, and one of the solutions that we thought of with our students is uh, to look at these towers. Maybe you know the towers, the names of the towers? Sorry? Marconi Plain, yeah, the Marconi Towers is one. Very old people remember them as Europoint Towers, but they have a new name now. The Lee Towers, ta-da, this guy. <laughs> so for foreigners, that's, that's hard to understand, but he's a Rotterdam singer, terrible singer, but, um, but people love him and, and, and the towers are named after him now. Uh, but my students thought about these, these were empty uh, towers where the municipality used to work. Uh, they wanted to make it a net positive building, um, not just looking at energy, looking at materials, at food, at water, at air. And they came with a solution, um, so with modular infills, um, people who are, don't have a lot of money and that have different ways of living, and, and Dirk was saying that, huh? so that not just for one typical household, no, for a single-use household, for people who live differently, also people with three adults, for instance, together, at, those are all possible. Um, it is a tower, it doesn't have an outdoor space, and balconies were impossible, so we had to create outdoor space inside. And then uh, we used this green wall uh, in the same time to actually purify the air coming in from outside, because Rotterdam is the dirtiest city of the Netherlands uh, because of the industry there. So if we can filter the air through the root zone of the, of the plants, then it comes in cleaner, cleaner, 
And uh, phase change materials, just like in this tower here, they sort of precondition the air to a temperature that is already quite acceptable. So um, this was an artist's impression of what we wanted to do with a facade as a power generator, because a, a tower has hardly any roof space, so putting PV on the roof doesn't have a big influence. So we proposed to use vertical solar panels in the facade, also uh, PVT chimneys, so that those are solar chimneys that produce electricity, heat and ventilation. Um, and then, of course, we for the competition, we couldn't... Uh, uh, build the whole tower and to show how what we were doing, but we took out a part of it. So here you see how we did that and This is what it became and now maybe you can recognize that block over there Because that's what the building is uh, So it's a one-on-one -on -one model uh, Real life size and uh, this was our entry to the competition of the solar decathlon 2019 and it was reconstructed here again and now it's being used as a meeting space, uh, but it's also livable. Somebody can live there. There's a bed inside and there's a kitchen and a bathroom. Um, so this is uh, one of the things. Not many people noticed that we were doing this in 2019, uh, but one person did and he invited us for coffee. <laughs> I don't know if it's a recommendation nowadays. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> but he should. He, I, I believe that he should be in your community, actually. Anyway. Um, <laughs> um, and that relates to finding added value. So um, I think we should put emphasis much more on the advantages of uh, the sustainable transition. It has been too much on reducing, doing less, uh, avoiding carbon emissions. No, it can also be something beneficial. And, and one of the things is if we use green, it has so many uh, advantages that it's actually a no-brainer that we should start to learn to work with green everywhere. Um, there's so many advantages that are related to it, so cities can help actually this whole transition. And ecologists know that biodiversity is the life insurance of the planet, because if we lose biodiversity and now it's collapsing terribly, um, that's, so we need to do something about it. And I think um, that we can also say that the life assurance of mankind is human diversity. So if we would have just one human species, then we're very vulnerable. So I believe that this is really, uh, I truly believe that this is important. Um, another added value we can find in, uh, in the built environment is if we use aquathermal heat more. That's basically taking out heat from water to heat your houses. Um, you use uh, heat exchangers for that with a heat pump system. Uh, what they do then is, of course, they cool the water because you take out heat and you... Um, but our water here is uh, already three degrees warmer than it should be. Two degrees because of climate change, and one degree because of all the heat that we discharge into the water, from power plants to industries to whatever. Um, so if we take out the heat, actually we, we create better water quality because at the moment it's terrible. It's, uh, there's a lot of bacteria and algae because of that temperature and because of nutrients. So the water quality will be better. We can create urban cooling in summertime if we also take out heat in summertime and store it. But of course, this is the most important thing for Dutch people. <laughs> if the water is, uh, is becoming two, three degrees cooler, then the probability of ice just increases. So we can do ice skating more rather than less. So, and this is only possible if we do this sustainable transition and not if we stick with gas boilers and, and find perhaps use hydrogen for that gas. That will, won't help because it doesn't help this transition. And this actually works because um, I used to, do, uh, this is of course important in the province of Frisia especially because uh, everybody's still hoping for a, 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 a ice skating to the Elfstedentocht. Um, and I was in contact with Gerrit Heemstra, our uh, meteorologist, uh, the weatherman of the news, and he has a house that has an aquathermal system. So he has this heat exchanger in this water on the right-hand side, and he was sending me this picture saying, hey, Andy, it works. <laughs> uh, you can see ice here in the harbor where the heat is taken out, and this is the river, uh, part of the Elfstede tour, and uh, it's still unfrozen. So you see that actually the principle works, it's just physics. So um, that's very nice to see. Now the final uh, added value I want to discuss is that you, 
couple sustainability to social societal issues. I don't think it will ever be accepted if we don't connect it to improvement of conditions of, of people, of poor people, of people who are minorities, of people who are discriminated, etc. So sustainability should always be combined with those social issues. And this is in a plan of my students of the Solo Decathlon again of last year, where we actually wanted to avoid the, the demolition of tenement flats, portique flats in Dutch, um, by renovating them. And the renovation is made possible by adding layers of uh, small modules, lightweight modules made of wood and other plant material uh, that could house, accommodate other people who have a little bit more money. And then the social houses underneath could be helped with renovating. Um, and the nice thing is that this new top-up addition could be the power plant for the houses underneath. So they help actually to reduce the energy bill of everyone. Um, like a reversed parasite, a parasite sucks out the life of its host. This, as this actually gives life to the host. Um, and if, if you do it well, then you can make actually the world or that neighborhood much more beautiful. And what you see here, that's why I wanted to show it, is the newest PV panels that you see in the facade. So um, they don't have to look ugly anymore. <laughs> we have we have panels that can be printed in different colors, all colors of the rainbow, and uh, they can have a print of a, of a painting like this one. Now this is an artist impression, so you might think, okay, yeah, everyone can make this drawing, but this is the real house as it is now in Wuppertal. So here you see those PV panels, and it has uh, the print of a view on Delft by uh, an unknown artist. Uh, we couldn't use the one of uh, Vermeer because that has copyrights, apparently. They know they had, co had copyrights in the 70th century, but okay. Um, <laughs> but this is really beautiful, so we can print anything. It could also have been printis, prints of uh, bricks or of green, or of whichever color. Um, so I think, again, I'm coming back to that statement, I think key for social sustainability is connecting. And I think that um, this should be about connecting between all people, all groups in society, uh, within and without certain groups, and acknowledge differences and helping one another. That's, that's the only way that sustainability can become a success. So in that sense, I would say uh, stay brave and be proud, and uh, good luck. Thank you very much, Andy, for that very nice presentation. I am sure there must be lots of questions. Uh, <clears throat> people at home, uh, also, uh, please type your questions in the Q&A. My colleague AJ can also uh, notify me when there's a question. But first here in the room, who has a question? Yes. Thank you. Well, first of all, I really like the pace in the presentation, so thanks for that. Um, my question is, um, as you presented, there are many technical solutions already, and I think many of them are really logical as well. Um, but still, we don't seem to get there to the sustainable world. So my question is, what is, according to you, the most or the biggest obstacle to getting to the sustainable world? Yeah, ooh, that's a big question. Um, I, I do believe, being from a technical university, that technology is not a problem. We have enough means now to make that sustainable transition. Um, but I think that uh, the main obstacle is people and, and, and uh, processes and, and the, the willingness or unwillingness of, uh, to create change. And we still see that in politics, uh, yeah, most politics in Europe are still very much influenced by lobby from the industry that have no, inf uh, no, no interest in, in changing. So I think we need a few brave people who dare to stand up against those mighty powers that have a lot of money. Um, and one of the solutions to, to help that transition when you dare to do so is, is uh, changing the financial system. Because at the moment, sustainability is more expensive because we're not paying for the damage we cause. And uh, because uh, kerosene for airplanes is not being taxed. And because we give subsidies to fossil fuels companies so that they can keep going and then making profits and uh, uh, changing their policy again because the profits are so interesting. Uh, so um, I think those, those are brave things that need to change. Um, but I start to believe that people up there at the moment don't do it. So we have to push it from on, on, underneath. Um, and that's why we see those 
uh, movements uh, like Extinction Rebellion and, and, and other uh, yeah, normal people that are worried and that want to create change if the powerful people don't. But it's a difficult question. <laughs> Everyone's trying to do uh, their best. Yeah. More questions? So I'm a bit curious, what happened to the towers? Were they radically transformed? Has any of your innovations actually been adopted or scaled up? Um, not with, with those towers. Um, while we were doing the project in between 2017 and 2019, um, two of the three towers were actually purchased by a developer and they made it indeed a, a, a more traditional apartment block which is a pity, of course. The third tower, then we decided, okay, this what we do is focus on the third tower, but um, nothing much has happened so far. Um, what did change is that um, um, a, a group of those students that worked on the plans, they started their own company, more Studio, and they were asked by a developer to help them with uh, the, the transformation of a, of a data center, an empty data center. And they did it exactly in the way that the towers were designed. So a to totally circular infill, um, PV panels on the outside that you don't recognize as PV panels. And so uh, they are now doing that and they're becoming like a company that is specialized in, in, in s sustainable circular transformations. Uh, so in that sense, it's, it, it, it gets a follow up, but not in the original plan. Yeah. So, um, we all know that um, the climate ha has been changing for, for centuries. And do you think the human beings are the only cause of this change? Um, there, there, there's natural changes to the climate. And, and we know exactly what these changes are because the, um, the natural changes are always related to um, the position of the Earth towards the Sun, which is slightly different sometimes. Uh, it, the tilt changes sometimes. There's uh, the activity of the Sun creates temperature differences once every 11 years. So we know quite exactly, uh, also when we have had uh, eruptions of volcanoes, we can sort of draw out the development of the temperature. Uh, need to draw it like this. Um, exactly. And, but then the temperature would have st uh, been approximately stable in the last uh, decade or more, or the last century or more. What happened since 1900 is that we see that next to those developments of, of natural causes, that actually these natural causes are shifted upwards very fast. And that's the human influence, that's the, the, the greenhouse gases that we have been emitting since the Industrial Revolution. So it, it's, it, uh, all, all climate scientists acknowledge that there's natural changes in the climate, but it has never gone, changed so fast as in the last century because of those additional uh, emissions. So uh, yes, uh, humans now are the dominant factor in, in climate change and not nature anymore. Yeah. David. Moon dust could help us? Sorry? Would, could moon dust help us? <laughs> moon dust? Have you heard about that? No, no. Uh, there's uh, studies now done that they... Um, of course, the moon's been evolving for millions of years and our damage is the last 200 years. But actually, uh, the studies now suggest that you could release dust from the moon, which would create kind of a, um, a layer that yeah, would yeah. reduce the heat on Earth. Ooh, geoengineering, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's research ongoing here on the university on so-called geoengineering. So can we control the climate on Earth by doing something in the outer atmosphere? This would be one of them. Um, I think it's tricky. We don't know the, all the impacts that it would cause. And I think the solutions are also here on the surface. So we, we, we can solve it also by not doing those rigid things on the outside. But yeah, it might, it might have a difference because, uh, you know, we also know that uh, eruptions and also that um, 65 million years ago um, meteorites that basically killed all dinosaurs, uh, that also caused some sort of layer around the Earth uh, that created a cooling down, a rigid cooling down. But I'm not sure if we would benefit too much of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's risky. Yeah. 
Um, in your thank you very much. It was very interesting your story. Um, shall I come even fast down? Um, it seems so logical that the, the, the solutions are connecting and storing. Mm -hmm. That are the key words, I think. Mm -hmm. Why is it so difficult for our our society uh, and our government to follow that good advice? Yeah. And what can we do? Yeah. On, uh, concretely. I think it's largely because of our legal system that um, we have currently a system that um, generates electricity, drinking water, uh, that processes wastewater centrally, outside the city normally, and that we have individual buildings in the, bu in the city that uh, are connected to those centralized system. We don't have a system where we actually connect with our neighbors and um, that, cre that, that sort of uh, demands for uh, a different type of responsibility and risk uh, analysis and uh, who is responsible for what. Uh, we need a party that actually can, on a meta level, that can, can service this whole interaction and, and the energy exchange. And, and we're getting started there now, so we have these uh, energy service companies that can help neighborhoods to transform. Um, but of course, yeah, it takes time to, to get that normal. And, and, and well, we have so many different people uh, with uh, people opposing to being connected, making it also difficult to do the investment. So th there's a lot of hurdles there. Uh, but in Amsterdam, we're now really trying to do that because Amsterdam has no solution actually for the inner city. <laughs> and the only, because they, and they don't want to put in any um, heat, heat system that is connected to the industry. Um, they decided not to do that. Um, a heat pump system is not possible because the, the, the buildings are not well insulated enough. So they have to come up with a different solution because they have to save 70% of, of their gas uh, use. Um, and there, this will become the best solution to connect and to exchange energy between the buildings. Um, but it's a big process because the municipality needs to support it. We need to find an energy exploiter who, who can take care of it. We need the investment of the piping. Uh, so it's not easy, but uh, I, I do believe that it makes a big difference if it's there. Yeah. That you don't have another solution. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But it's a logical solution. Here on the south campus of TU Delft, uh, there's all modern buildings coming, and and their demand is a low temperature heat demand, um, and they need a lot of cooling. So there, a network will be laid out that will transport heat and cold, and and connect all the different buildings together with seasonal storage. Um, so with m newest developments, it's a very logical thing to to not just solve it on the building level, but to think about the larger scale and connecting. Um, with an existing building, that uh, existing city, uh, that's a more difficult thing, but we will need it sometimes, yeah. yeah. If I may ask a question connecting to this one. Mm -hmm. um, what if we would change the entire TUDELF to be net zero in terms of energy? What would need to happen and what would be your recommendation also to our board of directors? Um, well, it, the transition is already happening, so at the moment to explain um, that's in the part that I didn't present. Um, uh, we purchase electricity coming from uh, wind parks in, at the sea. Um, so you could say that that uh, energy is, is carbon neutral, not not completely, but it's better than nothing. And uh, the biggest problem is our gas use for the heating system in the campus. Um, we are now uh, changing that to a geothermal system, so um, making it part also of research. We don't know so much about deep geothermal heat and how to use it optimally. So uh, we want to do that. Um, and in the meantime, try to increase our uh, own production of uh, renewable electricity. So more solar panels. Uh, I think we need a few wind turbines on the south campus. Um, and then in the end, that should sort of uh, be possible by 2030 to have that done. But it's a it's a big challenge. But I think if we don't if we can't do it here at the technical university, how do we expect cities to do that? So we need to to show how it's done. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds exciting. Are there any more questions? I think we would have time for one or two. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you said in your last uh, slide was connecting. Yeah, that is really necessary to make uh, developments. What do you see happening there? Are we able to connect in the Netherlands with all different uh, kind of companies and uh, organizations to make next developments? 
Yeah, I think the awareness is starting to drop in uh, that uh, this is a necessity um, within cities because of all th this diversity of functions. And, but also um, we, we see gradually ecosystems, <laughs> so-called ecosystems of companies in, in, in industrial areas or office areas that see that uh, they can better solve the, the whole solution of energy uh, by collaborating with their neighbors and, and making a, a joint system. Um, so I, I do believe that this is happening gradually. Um, it's, it's less common, like I said also, to with um, uh, the existing built environment where people live and where there's not so many companies. But I think cities can also steer towards that. And um, since we are seeing now that energy renovations, especially with historical uh, neighborhoods in cities, is going really slow and, and it's very difficult, uh, we should not try to find all the solutions within renovation always, but also trying to find the solution in, in, in um, uh, delivering renewable heat and, and cold or electricity to those buildings. And that can only be done if we start connecting. So I, I think so, uh, the, the older cities are now trying, uh, starting to see that, that um, um, the old way of tackling it, handling it, is, is not working anymore. So we need to get there. Um, so I hope I can contribute to that by, by uh, bringing in the knowledge I have from projects we've done so far where we showed that it's possible and that it leads to the best results. Yeah. But it will take time, but I, I consider, well, we have seven years to 2030. I think by 2030, we need to be ready here and other parts of the world should be on the right track. That's not a lot of time, seven years, but um, uh, yeah, that's the urgency we need. Yeah. One more question for me, I guess. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. You're I also liked it that you said there needs a social component yeah. added to it, and that there should be something positive for the people involved. Yeah. And that also sounds to what the stories that I hear from Delft, that very often you can have all, all organizations together, but when you go into the build-up area, into the people's uh, area, mm -hmm. Uh, there's quite some social problems which you will bump into. Yeah. And that is hindering it as well. So it's not only the energy transition or technical transition, but you need to think about the society in the neighborhood where you go to. And that can be, um, well, there needs to be something positive in them yeah. for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I fully you agree. have some experiences about that? Yeah, I've done workshops across Europe for a European project where we also had to go into the neighborhood and talk to citizens, to companies, to the public officers and so on, and to get to a plan for their neighborhood. Um, those plans that we presented in that project, and it was very strongly uh, commended by, by the EU, is that we always came up with a combination of technical, spatial, social and economic solutions. Because... Um, key was really that you provide extra um, options, extra, extra opportunities for the local people to, to become better of that transition. And um, so we also showed how they could start sustainable businesses that would help the neighborhood also to become sustainable and make money for them uh, to, um, to, to start connecting with the neighbors also in systems so that they could save their energy bills and in the meantime become uh, a more... Uh, uh, how do you say it? Uh, a more uh, livable area. Uh, so we have a lot of examples of those. So those solutions were always a combination of those elements. So uh, technical, spatial, uh, cultural, um, social, and also economic. So uh, also give opportunities for them to, to, to make money in a sustainable way. Yeah. I hope we find good ways to do that. It's yeah. really important in some areas. It's some people are just surviving at the moment. Yeah, and true. We need to help them. Yeah, we need exactly. To help them. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm happy that you can do that in Delft eh, from your political side. So <laughs> keep up the good work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, well, I would like to end it here. So let's thank Andy again for the very nice presentation. Thank you.